Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, 1089. Uh, and I might just start from chapter 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Say, thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember how far you have fallen. Repent. And do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. I know your afflictions and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you and you will experience affliction for ten days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers will be never harmed by the second death. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has a sharp double-edged sword, I know where you live where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death among you, where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to eat meat, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Thus says the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service and endurance. I know that your last works are greater than your first. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction. Unless they repent of her works, I will strike her children dead then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching and who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I am not putting any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who conquers and keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations and he will rule them with an iron scepter. 
He will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Write to the angel in in Sardis. Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthened what remains which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief and you have no idea what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close, because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, an ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love are rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Let me pray, and then we'll start unpacking it. Uh, Heavenly Father, help us to be humble uh, as we hear your word. Uh, Help us to have ears to hear and hearts to receive uh, what you say to us. Uh, Help us to uh, see the comfort that this is, uh, but also to see how it confronts our sinful natures. Amen. Uh, While I was going through primary school, we used to have what's called a three-way conference. Uh, Essentially, it was a mid-year catch-up between the teacher, student and parents uh, to see how the student was going. Work would be assessed, grades would be given. It was easy to see where a student's desire was 
as this would be reflected in their work. Uh, often PE, I would be doing quite well because that reflected my desire. Maths and English, mm, not so much. I remember one particular time, I would have been about year four or year five, when we had one of these conferences. I walked into the room with my mum, uh, walked across the floor to the teacher who was sitting at the table. Uh, he was the deputy principal at the time. We sat down and I said, so Stewie, how do you think we're doing? Uh, this is not the normal way that a student interacts with their teacher. I had potentially become a little bit familiar and comfortable with my teacher, maybe even a little bit complacent who was in front of me. I had potentially blurred the boundaries between the man who was my teacher and the man who was my father. It was a great privilege to be taught by my dad. Uh, but it did create some interesting conversations around the dinner table. Uh, there was another teacher in another room, and all we could hear was him wetting himself in laughter at my comments. Uh, yes, he was my dad who would comfort me, but he was also my teacher who would confront my, at times, uh, laissez-faire attitude to schoolwork. I needed to remember both, the one who comforts and also the one who confronts. And we find a similar dynamic here in the seven messages to the churches. As Jesus ascended to the Father, he promised that he would be with his people to the very end of the age. Now, that was about 50 years before what we're reading now. Jesus said that he would be with his people wherever they go. Isn't that a comfort? But as we heard last week, John has just received a vision of the glorified Jesus, and he's terrified. He falls to the ground as though dead. Uh, is this a radically different Jesus? No. This is, the, this is the same Jesus who cares and comforts. He reaches down and touches John and says, it's okay, don't be afraid. And so at the end of chapter 1, we're left with this image of Jesus who is both tender but terrifying. And so it's no surprise that we see this dynamic in Jesus' messages to the seven churches. Yes, these messages will be full of comfort to those who are already walking faithfully with Jesus and with those who have ears to hear and to those who repent. It will be comforting. But these messages will also confront and not just for one particular church, but for all the churches. We have to remember that while each church is addressed individually, they're not addressed privately. What applies to one will apply to all. So we're getting, starting to get a fuller picture of what it means to have Jesus walk among the lampstands, to be in the presence of his people, the church. And so as the messages are read out, the question is raised. How would these seven churches receive what Jesus has to say? Would they have ears to hear the judgment, both good and bad, of Jesus? Would they be open to seeing themselves as Jesus did? Would they be humble and repent as Jesus pleads? Or will they deflect, defend, or dismiss what Jesus says? Assume that the problem of that church over there is only restricted to them, because that's not my problem. Will they do what he calls them to do, even if it's costly, humbling, and hard? Now, these questions naturally aren't just for those who heard it first, but for us as well. Our seven churches, seven numbers in Revelation are important. Uh, it's the complete number, the whole number. As we listen to Jesus' words, are we open to being exposed, convicted, challenged? Uh, the Jesus we meet in chapters 2 and 3 is both saviour and judge. Uh, the presence of Jesus among each church will either confront them or comfort them, 
depending on their situation. Some of the churches are under constant threat of overt hostility by others in their society. Some are engaged in internal struggles, wrestling with the extent to which Christian communities can accommodate to the imperial culture around them. And on the far end of the spectrum, there are those churches who are comfortable and complacent in their prosperous communities. All the churches are at risk. Risk of assimilation, risk of persecution, a risk of complacency. How would they stay true to Jesus in the midst of these pressures? Uh, there is an outline in your bulletins. Uh, we've missed point one. We're up to point two now. Risk to the churches. So we're, I'm going to look through these churches not in order, uh, but in these groups. Okay, so uh, we won't be working one to seven. We'll be working in these categories, risk to the churches, assimilation, persecution, and complacency. And so first, risk of assimilation, Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira. Now, these three churches were at risk of assimilation due to their doctrine and or practice. So what they believed and how they lived out their faith. Now, Ephesus... Starting at verse 1, it's the first cab off the rank and is commended by Jesus. He says, I know your works, your labor and your endurance, and that you don't tolerate evil people. Pergamum with Thyatira are also commended. Pergamum is where Satan's throne is, and yet they haven't denied the faith. Uh, it was the cultural and administrative center of the area and boasted some of the most well-known and celebrated temples to both the cultic gods and emperor worship. Uh, it would have been a tough place to live. Jesus commends them that they haven't denied the faith. And Thyatira, Jesus says, I know your works, your love, your faithfulness and your endurance. These churches are commended for aspects of their church life. Now, from their own perspective, they may have thought things were going well, but the health of the church wasn't being graded by their own perspective, but that of Jesus. They were being judged by the one who was ever present among them, who held all the church in the palm of his hand, who had the power to judge with words like a sharp double-edged sword, and whose eyes like fiery flames pierced word and deed. This is how Jesus has introduced himself to these churches. There is great comfort knowing that the struggles of a follower of Jesus are seen and known by Jesus. But it's also confronting knowing that Jesus also perceives the desires of the heart. The Ephesian church, the first church, while solid in their knowledge of the truth... They had, had abandoned the love they had at first. Uh, verse 4, uh, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love. They knew the gospel. They knew the head of the gospel, but they'd forgotten the heart of the gospel. Uh, we're not given specifics, but maybe their initial enthusiasm for Jesus had been replaced by staunch defense of gospel orthodoxy or their love for being right more than a conduit of grace and mercy to those around them. They know the gospel, and yet they've lost their first love. In contrast, Jesus rebukes the churches of Pergamum and Thyatira for their poor doctrine, for allowing the teachings of Balaam and tolerating the woman Jezebel. Now at this point, alarm bells should be ringing very loudly. Uh, for those who know their Old Testament, these two unsavory characters caused Israel to adopt the sinful practices of those around them. So Balaam, Numbers 22 and on, and Jezebel, 1 Kings 16. And instead of pointing the church to God, these two influential people are pointing to the culture around them and saying, see how good they have it. Maybe we should bring some of that in. It won't hurt to be a little bit more like those around us. 
It'll make it easier to fit in. Will they learn from the lessons of the past? Jesus will not tolerate sin within his church. Are those who live without gospel love or those who love have a love of sinful practices will be judged. The lampstand will be removed. He will fight against them with the sword of his mouth and bring great affliction and strike dead those who follow false teachers. He says, unless they repent of, their, of her works, I will strike her children dead. So those who follow, those who have been born out of this teaching. The warning to Thyatira is meant for all the churches. Uh, verse 23, then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts. The church is at great risk when it flirts with the attractiveness of the world around them. It's not enough to know the truth, but to put that truth into practice, to hold fast to Jesus, to the sake of all others. Jesus calls those who are compromising with the world around them to repent, to turn back to him. These three churches were at risk of assimilation, of compromising what they believed and how they lived out their faith. But this is only one risk that threatens the churches. Internal threats are one thing, external threats are another. The churches of Smyrna, so the second church, and Philadelphia, the sixth church, face the risk of persecution. I remember last week Bernard mentioned how persecution faced by God's people at this time was not widespread, but rather local, uh, nor was it instigated by the imperial government, uh, but more generally by local towns and the local people. And for Smyrna, this took the form of slander. Uh, verse uh, nine, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but a synagogue of Satan. Jesus says that they will be imprisoned and there will be likely death in verses 9 and 10. Jesus knows their affliction and their poverty. Their situation has not escaped his view. Now here we're starting to see the heavenly perspective. That's not just circumstance or human begrudgment, but rather the devil that is behind this. Now, even in this, we are to understand that Jesus has the power and authority. Themes that will be unpacked later in the book. Smyrna's afflictions, while difficult and costly, will not last forever. Now, Jesus says, you will experience affliction for 10 days. Now, 10 days it's not ongoing, it's a fixed amount of time. In a similar way, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, the powers at work are that of Satan. Jesus uses strong language of those who claim to be God's people but are not. Those in Philadelphia are viewed as outsiders. But in God's view, they know the one who holds the keys to the king's house. Take comfort, you are the true insiders. For both of these churches, the risk of injury and the loss of life is real. These are no easy cities to live in. But unlike the words to the first group, which were to confront their sin, or their lack of love and adulterous ways, Jesus' words to Smyrna and Philadelphia are only positive. They are encouraged to be faithful, to hold on to what they have, Yes, what they have may not seem like much, especially when compared to the other churches and definitely to the prosperous society around them. But we have to remember that Jesus is judging his churches by his measure and his standards, not by the world's standards. He says, Smyrna, though you seem poor, you are rich. Jesus does not promise to remove the affliction or that they will escape death. But he seeks to comfort them, comfort his church that is persecuted because of his name. 
Uh, even the description he uses at the start to introduce this, uh, the two letters to Smyrna and Philadelphia should bring them comfort. For Smyrna, he says, Thus says the first and the last, uh, verse 8, uh, the one who was dead and came to life. So what is true of Jesus is true for those who faithfully follow him. Yes, they may die, but as Jesus conquered death, so they too will conquer death because of him. Threats within and threats outside are at times easier to recognize. Those with eyes to see may be able to identify that there is a problem. Jesus certainly sees the risk of assimilation and persecution. And hopefully we would be able to see ourselves and so lean further into Jesus and if need be, repent of our ways. What is harder though is when everything seems to be going great. No risk of persecution, no internal threats or struggles, just enjoying prosperity like the society around you. This is the grave threat for the churches of Sardis and Laodicea, so the fifth and the seventh church. These differ significantly from the rest of the, for this reason. It's the absence of threat that is the risk, the risk of complacency. Note again the dual perspective being shown. Sardis, so chapter 3, verse 2, uh, verse 2, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Or later, see, you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. But I know your works, says Jesus. You're neither cold nor hot, you're lukewarm. These churches claim to be doing well. We're alive, we're rich, and yet from Jesus' perspective they are almost dead and they are disgusting to the point of being vomited out of his mouth. Jesus does not pull any punches, especially not with Laodicea. They say, we're rich, we've become wealthy, we don't need anything. And Jesus says, but you don't realise You are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They have such high opinions of themselves, and yet they are on the precipice of destruction. Wake up, says Jesus. You are so lukewarm, so apathetic, so comfortable. They gather together thinking they are healthy, wealthy, and wise, and yet in reality are so anemic and they have such lack of awareness that they don't understand that the most dangerous intruder will not be local opposition or false teaching but Christ himself these two churches are in dire straits all because they have become complacent making a shipwreck of their faith yet they do have some hope There are a few in Sardis who have not defiled themselves and hold on to Jesus. And as Jesus tells those in Laodicea, he rebukes and disciplines those he loves. He still loves them, but he calls these churches to remember what they have heard, to keep it, and to repent. The messages to the churches are individual but they are not private. Each one receiving the other's message from Jesus. And so would be fully aware that the risks of assimilation, of persecution and of complacency that arises from prosperity might apply to them at any time. And it might even make them question how they are going in light of other churches who are doing so much better than them. These churches are meant to hold the light of God out to a dark and needy world. They are lampstands. 
Uh, this imagery is picked up uh, earlier in the Old Testament. The present will be... Uh, the, the reason Jesus is so uncompromising about the purity of doctrine and the behaviour of the, of the churches is because they reflect God to the world. Jesus deeply cares about the holiness of his church and how it reflects him to the world around them. Now, the church is at great risk. But Jesus promises great reward for those who hold fasts. Our last point on your outline. The present will be fraught with risk, but to the one who conquers, abundant blessing awaits. In most of the messages, Jesus offers invitations for deeper fellowship with him. These promises, while given to each church individually, are for all corporately. I hope you heard the refrain, to the one who conquers. Each message ends with these words. So whether you're fighting against compromise or persecution or apathy and complacency, the faithful person is depicted in this military metaphor of conquering. And so it means that by its nature, it will be a struggle It will be a struggle to hold fast to sound doctrine when the world tells you, why not just have a little bit of this? It'll make it easier to blend in with the world. Or for a love of God and a love for others. It will be a struggle to see your life and circumstances through Jesus' perspective and not the world's. Yes, you may seem poor, But in Jesus' view, you are rich. It will be a struggle to trust in Jesus' promises in the midst of hardship and persecution. It's important to not take these messages to the seven churches in isolation. Uh, In one sense, this is the easiest part of Revelation to understand. It's uh, less imagery-based, to an extent, Uh, the rest of the book gets a little bit more tricky. But these messages to the churches are merely the opening to the rest of the letter of John. For many of the endings, the reward for those who conquer are mentioned throughout the rest of the book. Those who conquer will receive eternal life, will be able to eat from the tree of life in the new creation and the new Jerusalem. So that's Ephesus and Philadelphia, language picked up in Revelation 22. They will not be harmed by the second death, as we heard in Smyrna, Revelation 20. Those who conquer will be dressed in white and have their name in the book of life. Uh, That's Sardis, and the imagery of white is picked up throughout the whole book. They will be given a place of honour, in God's house and given power and authority. The one who conquers will be given the morning star. Now this one, this last one's interesting and if you're the youth grouper who asked this on Friday night, here's your answer. Jesus will give the one who conquers himself. Now Jesus is the morning star. Now Revelation 22.16 Seek after Jesus, be faithful to Jesus, and he will give you himself, the prize of your faith. So what does it mean to conquer? Uh, Just quickly as we wrap up. Uh, This will get unpacked throughout the rest of the book. But uh, just like the Olympics, if you can't go through all of it at once, let me give you the highlights. Revelation 14 verse 4 Those who are counted within the people of God are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. To conquer is to follow the Lamb. Revelation 12, 11. They conquered Him, called the devil and Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. 
for they did not love their lives even to the point of death. Jesus calls for radical, wholehearted student followers, those who have weighed the cost of discipleship and who love Jesus more than their own lives, those who value Jesus' perspective more important than those opinions and perspectives of others, who treasure Jesus more than the wealth that society says we must acquire. Jesus knows our deeds and he knows our desires. He knows when those two don't match. If Jesus was to write us a message for our church today, what would he say? What would he say to our Bible study groups? Our different ministries, kids club, youth group, wooden homes, men's and women's events. What would he say about our family devotion times, our personal evangelism, our one-on-one time with him in his word? Jesus longs to be the one we seek for he is worthy of our everything. He will comfort us in our pain and hardship, but he will also confront us with our sin if we look to the world for validation and meaning. He calls us to be repentant. As we read these messages and as we read the rest of Revelation, have these messages in mind. In the next few weeks, we will see how the coming visions help awaken the complacent, strengthen the persecuted, and bring those tempted to assimilate to a renewed sense of faithfulness. At the the very end, we will see the reward for those who conquer by the blood of the Lamb. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, you have given these words uh, for your glory and for our good. Uh, you You are calling your church to be holy as you are holy, to not assimilate with the world around us, to hold fast in persecution and to wake up to the complacency that so often plagues us. Now, Heavenly Father, help us to hear your word and take comfort. Heavenly Father, help us to hear your word and be confronted with our sin. Now, help us as we uh, journey through the rest of Revelation uh, to see how you are calling us to awaken to the risk of assimilation, to the comfort of persecution, and to the danger of complacency. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.